Mr. Mayor, Council, good afternoon. Mark Kirby, Fire Chief, Mesquite Fire Department. I'd like to go over the 2018-19 budget, budget offers, and a little bit of performance standards for the Mesquite Fire Department for uh, 2017. Start off with 2017. This is calendar year 2017 uh, response numbers for the department. Uh, we made a little over, uh, well, uh, cl uh, close to 19,000 responses 2017. We came at 18,836. 436 fire responses, and we had 184 structure fires. And I've told you several times over the years that we come in around, right, just usually under 200 structure fires a year, and that's pretty that's pretty uh, baseline what we normally see. Uh, of those, 14,134 of those responses were EMS responses. And just to give you an idea from the calendar year 2016, we had 13,868 responses. So the increases that we did see were pretty much all in EMS responses, which is 75% of what we could do, as you can see from the pie chart. As far as the performance goes, um, this is for our fire response. And on the left, you see our goal in green. And on the right and the red, you'll see our actual response. Excuse me, the red is the goal, and the green is what, how we actually came out in 2017. In uh, 2017, our fire responses, our average, we're at 524. So we're actually under our goal. Our goal is 529. So we're actually at or just a little bit under our goal. Same on a 90% responses, and that's at 735. And our goal there is 750. And what, what you basically, how to interpret that is 90% of the time, we'll get there at 7 minutes and 35 seconds or less. That's our 90% goal. But on average, we'll get there at 524 for seven, 2017. On the EMS side, we were close to our goals, just a little over, 509. Our goal is 459 on average. And within 90%, our goal is seven minutes. We got there at 713. So a lot more EMS responses. So a little bit better sample. But still close. For the budget for uh, 2019, uh, as you can see, um, as Debbie uh, told you, we're 3.46 above what it was for 2018. The percent change in personnel services was the most of it at 3.21%. That's just basically raise, raises. Contractual services, the increase there is basically a, a contract with the city of Garland to actually provide services for our new Motorola P25 uh, radio system. And basically those are services not covered under warranty. And it's normal to have the co contract, a maintenance contract for radio, radio system services. Uh, supplies, the increase there was basically We'll talk a little bit later about it, bunker gear and also some ballistic vests for our arson investigators that have to be replaced this year. But overall, 3.46% over. Some of our quality of life, uh, things that are made possible by the quality of life uh, fund, basically we're replacing our a truck and it's one of our biggest uh, projects for the year for next year. Um, and you see the truck down there, it's a truck one, so one of our uh, aerial trucks. Uh, it's being replaced. Actually, it's not going to be replaced. It's going to move over to the reserve status. We're replacing a 1997 aerial that we've had since that year. Uh, so we're in dire need of that. But that's at $1.1 million. They've went up quite a bit since we bought that truck. That truck there cost $550,000. And that's how much they've went up since 2005. Uh, we're going to replace a bomb robot, $350,000. You can see it there, the top picture. Uh, that one is a, a vintage 1990s robot. Um, we've done a lot of upgrades on it, though, since that time, but the chassis part, it's, it's time, the platform part, it's time to go ahead and replace it. Uh, Battery-operated hydraulic rescue tools, 69,000. Uh, we bought these back in 2004, and they were very handy on our fire engines. Um, these are only going to go on the fire engines, but they are 2004 models, and it's time to replace them. Uh, Knox Key Secure System replacement. You can see this little thing down in the right looks almost like a little robot. Um, basically, th that is a device that we keep our Knox box keys in. And those keys go to our businesses, the Knox boxes they have, so we can get in businesses if we have alarms go off at night and we don't have a business owner there to unlock the door. So we can get in without damaging their, their door. If it's not on fire, that's very important to the business owner. But we have to have a way of securing those keys and keeping good accounting of them. We have to replace this system because they don't make parts for our current system we have now. So we need to go on to the next generation. And you can see the little antenna. We can pull audits off this remotely. We're the ones now we have to go hook into to do any kind of audit on. 
and replace the thermal, thermal, a few of our thermal imaging cameras. This is an ongoing uh, project that we have almost every year. Uh, we have thermal imaging cameras on almost all of our fire equipment. Some of our operational changes that we made during 2017 into 2018. What I want to talk to you a little bit about is our mock station alerting system. This is part of our P25 radio system. The new technology with the digital radio system wouldn't allow us to actually utilize our old alerting system that we had for our uh, fire stations. The new system has one that's a lot more sophisticated and gives a lot more information. As you can see in the uh, picture right there, you can see the incident display board. This incident display board basically goes off at the same time the station is alerted. You can see the equipment, what type of call, where they're going, the address. It even gives them a Google, Google map, a small Google map of where they're going. It also has a count up timer that tells them uh, right here how long it's been since the call was actually dispatched to give them kind of a running feedback of what the time has been. And that, they carry that out to the apparatus room. That's what this is. Same display, same time. Gives them a running time. Then they, they know what time it was dispatched versus what time they're getting out of the house. Another one that we're still working on is our self-contained breathing apparatus replacement. Uh, we're replacing all of our self-contained breathing apparatus. This is a bread and butter item for a fire department. Uh, we have about 80 something in our in our 80 something of these units in our department, and we're replacing them about once every 17, 18 years. The bottles are only good for three testing cycles of about five years. Uh, and usually, when the bottles go out, is when we replace the system. So we're replacing the system this year. And we've almost got the shipments almost complete. We're still waiting on some masks and the training schedule for, for all of our members later this summer to go to this new system. Another operational changes we're in the process of doing is uh, firefighter cancer mitigation. I touched basis on this a few uh, council meetings ago uh, when uh, you approved a project to actually put in a few more of these devices that you see here. This is called a washer extractor. It's a heavy-duty washing machine, basically. And this is what we have to use to, to clean our bunker gear in. The cancer studies that are coming out on firefighters show that we're about a 9% greater increase of cancer than general population. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to put in programs that will mitigate this down. And basically, one of, the things of car one of the forms of carcinogens we get is the actual bunker gear that we wear inside these structure fires. It's just, it, it, it gets contaminated every time we go fight a, a structure fire. What we're trying to do is basically, it's a two-step two program. The first step you approved in the council meeting was putting these extractors in all the fire stations. I'll step to station four, and we'll get to it when we get a new, new station there. But all the rest of them will have it. Currently, we only have them at station one and station three. The second part is basically getting the firefighters a second set of bunker gear. When we go in after a structure fire, and let's say it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, well, they still have a lot left uh, time left on their shift that they have to work, so we have to have bunker gear for them. The bunker gear that they're in, they can put them in the extractor and clean it, but it has to be dried before they can wear it again, and it has to be air dried. It can't be mechanically dried. So basically, they need another set of gear to actually get into. So our second phase of this project is to get them in a second set of bunker gear. And in this budget, we're actually going to do a five-year phase in to do that. And in this one, it'll get about 45 set of, sets of new gear uh, for these firefighters. So at least 45 of them, a little bit more than that, because we do have some excess gear available. We'll have a second set of bunker gear, and then we'll keep on doing that. Yes, sir? Um, what's the number of gear to do 100%? Give me one second, because I've got that number. We've got 205 firefighters. This will get 45 of them, so we'll need about, you have to have about $300,000 to do it. They're $2,100 per set. We're spending $94,000 to do it this year to get these 45 sets. So, wait, wait, so 95000 for 45 sets, mm -hmm. you need, and I mean, I, how many total sets do you need to do 100% replacement for the department? For the I department? Mean, I understand how many personnel you need, but how many, 
how many well, of these gear do you need to have a hundred percent replacement for the second set of gear for the let's department? just look at the ones assigned to operations right right so if you if you take out my staff that's 183 sets so 183 people and I'm going to take out my three deputy chiefs because they really don't need them. So you need about 180 sets. So you need an additional 135 in order to go to 100%. For all of them. Hmm? 378,000 for all of them. You take out the what I've already got budgeted, which is about 94,000. Additional 284,000, about $300,000. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Also, trying to get everybody a second set of bunker gear, it's not just a one-time cost. It's a cost, an ongoing cost, because you have to replace that bunker gear. It's only good for 10 years from the date of manufacture. The way we did this, basically, is we tried to find the, the firefighters that were at the five- and six-year mark of their bunker gear. They had five or six years into it. Get them a new set. So every five or six years, we're replacing bunker gear, and we're trying to do that for the rest of the firefighters. It's not perfect, though. There's no way you can do it because you're hiring somebody on. You're going to have to get them a second set of bunker gear, two sets of bunker gear. So you try to do as many as you can, but it's not going to be perfect. Some of them you'll have to replace close, closer to the time period for them to all have a second set. Any questions on this project? Next how, long do you, how long do you expect that bunker gear to last? What's the life of that bunker gear? The most that the, it can last is 10 years, and that's from the date of manufacture. NFPA says after 10 years, you can't use it anymore, and the state of Texas has actually adopted that standard. Um, realistically, uh, we usually put them in at about seven or eight years. Um, I expect, I don't know this for a fact, but I expect that the gear probably wear quicker because we're going to be cleaning it a lot more frequently because now we're cleaning it twice a year. We have it sent out twice a year to have it professionally cleaned and also repaired. And that will continue, but we'll probably only send, send it out once per set of gear to be professionally cleaned and professionally um, uh, repaired as needed. But I'm thinking it's going to shorten the life of the, of the gear, cleaning it so much. But I can't give you an exact, exact time frame on it, but I know it's not any good after 10 years. Any other questions? Station number four, uh, we just finished the, um, not the design phase, but the schematic phase of, de of designing this station. And I'm giving you an idea what it's going to look like now. I want you to see what it's going to look like. I want you, I want you to tell me what you think. Uh, what we basically did was the architects went into station four, our current station four, and interviewed the firefighters. They took a look at the station. What they found out was the firefighters actually enjoy working at that fire station. And they told me one of the reasons why is because they get so much natural light in it, and it's such an open design. They loved it because it was a mid-century modern building. That didn't mean anything to me at the time, but now it does. It's a, called a mid-century modern building. In our, and they really wanted to go in and say, okay, why don't we build a more of a mid-century modern building but bring it to today's standards? And that's kind of what you see here in this drawing is a mid-century type modern building, but to today's standards. A lot of light coming in uh, to the, uh, the day area, also in the apparatus room. Open it up just a little bit for you, as you can kind of see a little bit of the floor plan is, we took the apparatus room and showed you what it would look like if it's full of equipment. That's totally full of equipment, and we're not gonna fill it up with equipment. Um, and what kind of spacing that you have there. Also gives you a cutaway view right here of what the station looks like from the front. You can get your south view, your north view, and across, of course, your street view from right here, what it would look like. As far as the site plan goes, this is Rodeo Center Boulevard. This is the current station. This is the property that we acquired to put the new station on. And you can kind of see how it lays out. We used a layout similar to what we have for fire station number three. It seems to work pretty good. It's very close to station one as well, but a little bit different the way it comes, you come in the back. But it's, you basically can drive around, employee parking is in the back, apparatus drives through the station, gets ready for another run, drives out, exit on Rodeo Center Boulevard. The floor plan. Day room is up here. This is the north. Day room is here. Kitchen is here. 
You have your exits here and exits here into the apparatus room for the firefighters. We did change the sleeping arrangements. We modernized the sleeping arrangements. Uh, the fire service has been going back and forth on open dormitories, just single dormitories where everybody had their own dorm. They've kind of settled upon this pod design here where you have three, three beds and lockers and one restroom for each pod. Captain does have, or the station officer does have his own pod. And we have an extra restroom here for not only if the captain can use it, but also as the firefighters come in, we try to design it for their health as well. That's why we have these lockers, excuse, airlocks, where they could come in if they need to shower off before they go into the station, they can use this restroom facility with shower. Yes, sir. No, no, and, and I think that's great. I mean, uh, isn't it true that the, the open dormitory was a little, not a lot, just a little problematic because one shift was coming on, the other shift was sleeping, and it's hard to stay asleep when a shift is coming in. This is going to allow these guys, absent a call for service, to be able to sleep without getting disturbed by the other shifts coming in and out? Not exactly. Well, then help me out with that. <laughs> Not exactly. Um, the way the Mesquite Fire Department does it, we have a wake-up time at 6 a.m. Now, that doesn't mean everybody gets up and at and goes, but it does allow them to know that there's, we need to start moving. There's another shift coming in. In this, in this configuration, you could spread out if, if it's not fully staffed. We, we, we did make it for 10. We're not immediately going to have 10 there, but we did build it for 10. If you're, not, if you're not filled up, they could space themselves out, and it could be a little bit more private. But the lockers are sta basically, they are still in the sleeping area. So that can still be somewhat problematic. Somewhat. Somewhat. So, so what are the benefits of the pod then? It does give them some, it does give them some more private spaces. It, if you have an open dormitory, you can have two guys that, are, that snore like a freight train, forgive me for that, and basically keep the whole dorm up. Uh, in this case, you can put the guy that snores like a freight train at the other end. He, you're going in that pod, and, and the re we'll fill the rest of the pods up. So it helps you out on those kind of things. I guess bottom line is you feel like this improves their quality of life. Is I, that do. Right? I do. I okay. um, do. With a single dorm rooms, it does take up a lot of space if you have one pod per person. Uh, it takes up a lot more space. You have to have a bigger station. And the fire chiefs I've talked to that have went to that in some of their stations, they, they ended up not liking it. They said it, it destroyed the camaraderie. The firefighters sometimes migrate back to their, their, their individual bunk rooms. And it, it kind of it destroyed a little bit of the culture and, and the, team, the, the teamwork stuff that goes on in a fire station. And they like this design a lot better. Irving went to this, they just opened station 12 and they went to this kind of design. Consideration given to the um, male-female dynamic should be more females in the, in the department. We try to have all our fire stations set up where uh, males and females can cohabitate in the fire station. Um, basically, our minimum sleeping attire is basically a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Uh, in this case, we all in all of our fire stations we have uh, lockers between the beds to give them some sense of privacy. So we kind of address that in all the fire stations and come down to a what's acceptable in, in, in our department. Uh, also, across the bay, we do have a workout room like we have in all of our newer fire stations. Uh, bunker gear area is here, extractor area is here. The bunker gear area and this EMS room, this is your required storm shelter as well. Uh, basically, the, under the 2015 code, we do have to have a storm shelter. This area right here will be designated and built as such in this new building. Keep losing my cursor, excuse me. But that's kind of the, that's the floor plan we're looking at right now. Now, we haven't went into the design development phase. A lot of things change, but this is kind of the direction that we're going in, if it's, if it's acceptable to you. Chief, I have a question. Yes. Okay, so everybody's going to have two sets of gear. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to put this second set of gear? I mean, are we building this station to hang, you know, and then there are other stations we're going to have that we've built. Most of the stations I've been at, you know, have enough, just enough to hang one set of gear. Where are we going to put all this other 200 sets of gears? That was a question that we really had to, we struggled with, especially on the, on the older stations. Uh, basically, what, one thing that wasn't in that equation I gave, it, gave you was the, actually the bags. There is a, there is a, comp a cost component into that for the bags, storage bags. 
Um, we're going to buy a set of storage bags for everybody so they can keep the second set in a storage bag kind of compact. And that storage bag will have to go in the locker area where they're existing on top of things or on the bottom of things. And on these, what we're looking at for the storage of the bunker gear in this new station is a wire rack, and it actually has a spot that'll accommodate that bag. So it's a better, it's it's a bigger area. Number one, number two, the racking area will allow for the storage of that. But it's going to be somewhat problematic in the other stations. Uh, go back to my first picture here. I just want to remind you while we're building a new fire station here for fire station four, and that is uh, the station does have some structural problems. But as you can see, the fire engine is very, it's a pretty tight fit getting the fire engine in. That's a modern fire engine. It's only a few years old. Uh, actually, that's not our shortest bay in the fire department. Station two has our shortest bay that we design our fire trucks around. So we make sure we all of our fire trucks can go in all of our bays, but it's pretty tight fit still. On to my budget offer. Uh, budget offer is for increased service level for ammo at six. And what we're asking for is basically some staffing to help us not to have to rely on overtime so much to staff Amulet 6 and then next year hopefully get our staffing up to where we can actually staff it on a 24-hour basis. As you can see, just to remind you that we staff it currently as a peak time ambulance and you can see here on our graph what that peak time consists of. Uh, we go all the way from midnight all the way to 11 p.m. at night here. And here's our run volume, usually for EMS. It, it usually it follows the activity of our citizens. As, uh, as we go through our working day, uh, it picks up, kind of peaks up here at traffic time at 5 p.m. And it starts trailing off after everyone gets home and have di has dinner and, and goes to bed, starts trailing off. We try to staff that ambulance on an overtime basis during that peak every single day because we really need the resources. $263,250 approximately for one year for three firefighters. And that includes their training and their gear. Just to go back on the overtime issue of Amulet 6, on the left is basically calendar year 2017, and this is how we staffed Amulet 6. As you can see, no overtime was required about 32% of the time. Our staffing allowed us to staff it without any overtime. This is for 2018, and you can see that's down to 21%. And that has to do a lot with attrition. Uh, I've lost 15 firefighters since July of last year, various means. Most of them are retirements, but I've lost 15 firefighters, and we're in the process of replacing them. It just takes time to get them all trained. And coming up with the staffing for Amulet 6, um, we used, at first we went, what you see in your budget book, we went with our normal, what we've normally used in our department is 1.25 firefighters per position. That's how we normally come up. That gives us extra staffing for vacations, holidays, and sick time, because it is a 24-7 operation. We went back and decided we wanted to look and see if there was a better model out there to staff the fire department, like more precise than just a thumb rule. And we found this model that Scottsdale, Arizona had used. It's not terribly complex. When you dig into it, it's, it makes sense. Uh, but Scottsdale is unique in that up until early 2000s, they actually had a private company that actually staffed their fire department. They owned the stations, they owned all the equipment, but in the early 2000s, that model didn't work for them anymore, so they went out to hire firefighters. So I found the model that they used to, to staff their fire department, Plus, I found an auditor's report from their city that actually had looked at it and made some suggestions on how to improve it. So we made the improvements, and we actually applied it to our department, starting with just zero. What we come up with, we looked at 2015, 16, 17, and 18. We looked at all of our leave, all of our lost time, all of our training time, and we, we applied this formula. And what we come up with is we need 5.72 firefighters to be able to staff this ambulance on a 24-hour day basis, or six. We need six firefighters instead of eight. So it did refine it a little bit. So we need six. We're going to hire three this time. I'm going to redo my staffing model a little bit to try to alleviate some of the overtime, but also flexible enough to be able to absorb these firefighters as we bring them on board. And hopefully after next year, sometime after next year, I can do away with the night staffing and basically staff it 24 hours a day. So my summary slide, basically, I went through all the uh, projects that we're going to be doing. 
uh, through 4B, including replacement of truck number one. Talked a little bit about the mock station alerting, our SCBA replacement, our plans for firefighter cancer mitigation, and of course, fire station number four. Um, and our one budget offer is basically to improve our staffing to help, help us not rely so much on overtime this next year and hopefully get some traction to actually put that uh, ambulance in service 24 hours a day. And I'm open for any questions you might have. Any comments or questions? So, so we're going to try to hire three firefighters to cut down on the overtime and the ambulance, is it going to go 24 hours then at this time or is to take care of that overtime plus we're still going to pay whatever it takes to put the ambulance in service full time this this year or is that going to be two years from now i can't put the ambulance in service 24 hours a day next this next year with three firefighters number one the three firefighters if i hire them october one i still have to train them uh, number two three firefighters won't do it you know i need six to actually be able to put it in 24 hours a day so we're basically just taking care of the overtime. We're trying to get, take care of the overtime the right now. The first year you'll help a little bit on the overtime. The second year you probably take care of the overtime and start building towards doing 24 hours a day. What I want to do is build my staffing charts. So basically when the, when the, when the, the firefighters start coming in, we start getting them out of training, that will normally go up to that number each shift that we'll be running at 24 hours a day. This ambulance will go up on our priority. It'll be the first priority to staff to get it into 24 hours a day. Our, you've seen our staffing chart. It it's, goes from like, right now it's at 46, 47, 48, 49, right. all the way up through the 50s. And it tells you what to staff, mm -hmm. the priority for staffing. This is gonna go up, it'll be our first priority right after the, the ambulances we have now and the engines we have now and the trucks we have now. It'll be the next one to get, to get the staffing to be 24-7. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Is the fire station, the elevations, do you like that concept? I need to, I'd really need to know that. <laughs> well, I love its personal taste, but does there anybody have a problem with that? This is what, if you've done it and they've asked for it, I'm fine with it. I think it's, I, I, I think, personally, I think it looks really nice, but I know it is an individual taste, and I want to make sure everybody's happy with it. I, I actually spent 13 years at that station. Uh, I think what you've shown here looks really good. I mean, you're trying to kind of keep the same concept. Uh, I enjoyed the station. Um, so I, li I personally like it. I like the dorm rooms the way you've got them uh, to break it up because I have been there when the snoring people are there. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it doesn't make a difference. And it, and it helps with our, you know, now that we have the females and, and our fire stations too, it gives them a little bit of privacy too. You know, we can kind of break them up. So, you know, that it, there's other things other than just the snoring. So. I think it's a great idea, personally, myself. There you go. Thank you very much.